Well, if you're a guest, I just want to welcome you um, on behalf of the church. Um, we try to be pretty simple around here. Uh, we are about Jesus. Uh, we want to be about him, and we want to recognize his presence, that we don't come to church uh, to hear a band necessarily. We don't come to church to hear a pastor, uh, because how many of you know, uh, at some point, we all have a shelf life. We come in the presence of God, which has no shelf life, right? That's why we gather here this morning and every Sunday and any other time we gather together. Today, we're going to continue this reset series where we've been looking at there are some areas of our life where we need to change our perspective to push the reset button. Not to where we believed as a little kid or what we were taught in school, but are there some areas of life we need to push the reset button to align with what God says? Because what I know is our perspective shapes our belief, and our belief will shape how we live our life. And so we've been asking some questions, some sometimes difficult questions. Is what is true? We've been asking about influence. What is God's perspective of influence? Uh, we talked a, a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago about, you know, what happens, what's our perspective of when we have jacked up and when we're running away from God, in the moment when we turn to him, what does God actually say and do? And we talked about the grace-filled Father. And last, last week we talked about relationships, right? Singleness and marriage and, and what kind of perspective does God have for each of those seasons of our life. Today, we're going to talk about another subject. And I joked around the staff. I said, hey, you know, the next two weeks, we're going to talk about marriage and money. If the third week we have anybody show up, it's by the grace of God. And so today we're going to talk about money. But here, before you get anxious, and if you're a guest, uh, I think this is going to be good for you as well. Uh, what I'm not going to do is tell you how to spend your money. And everybody said amen to that, Derek. Like, I don't want a pastor telling me how to spend my money. Um, I agree. Uh, my job, my role as your pastor is not to tell you what to think. I've told you before, my job is to raise up the word of God. And as believers, our hope is that we live a life of resets where we keep recognizing, man, there's some things we're believing that are not aligned with God. There's things that we're doing that are not aligned with God. And so those opportunities have us where we can then align with God, align with God. And by the way, that's a lifelong process, right? I don't care if you've been following Jesus for 40 years. Listen, you may and will need to push the reset button still in your old age and maturity in Christ to align more and more with him until you see him face to face. That's just the reality. So today we're going to talk about money, not how much to give to the church, not tithing, not offering, not any of that stuff. I want to talk about our perspective of finances. What, what do we think about money? And then how does that thinking, how does that lead us to actually utilize our money? That's what I want to talk about today. And I want to start with... A story uh, about Jesus. Uh, Jesus was walking the earth and, and he gets to a town uh, called Jericho and he's passing through and there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus uh, happened to be a wee little man and a wee little man was he and, uh, and he couldn't see uh, over the crowds and so this Zacchaeus wee little man he climbed up in a tree. It happened to be a sycamore tree and uh, so that he could get a better view of Jesus. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't just your normal dude. He was actually, in the scripture it says that he was a very wealthy man and he was a chief tax collector. Now, if you've been to this church for a few months, you've probably heard me talk about tax collectors. Tax collectors in the days of Jesus were like the worst of the worst. Like you had sinners, which was all the people that kind of gave their life to debauchery, and if that even word is relevant today, sin in general. You had that group, but then you had a whole nother group of people that were kind of below them that were called the tax collectors. And the tax collectors were Jewish men who had kind of sold their soul to the uh, government in order to tax their own people these crazy amounts in order to make themselves rich, okay? And so if you remember, I've said tax collectors, what I term them as, is like sinners on steroids, right? Like they're like the worst of the worst. But, but I don't know if you know this, there's actually something worse than a tax collector, a sinner on steroids. There's actually this thing called a chief tax collector. And this is what Zacchaeus was. And that means he was like the district manager of all the tax collectors, and he was wealthy, and he was good at what he did. And so if uh, a tax collector is a center on steroids, a, a chief tax collector is like a center on steroids plus human growth hormone, if you know what I'm talking about. Like this was the worst of the worst kind of guy. And, and he happened to be over a district known as Jericho. And Jericho was known for its, its um, uh, trade. And so there were lots of things to tax. And, and because there was lots of things to tax, Zacchaeus lived a high life, man. He made lots and lots of money, and he was wealthy. But in this moment of his life, he heard that this guy, this normal dude, was walking around. His name was Jesus. And, and in this moment, he humbles himself. He, he wants to get his, 
His eyes on Jesus. Who is this Jesus that I've heard about, the miracles that I've heard about, the teaching that I've heard about? And so he humbles himself. He's a wee little man, right? So he can't see over the crowd. So he climbs up in a tree, really humbles himself. A man with lots of money getting up in a tree. You don't see that every day, but he wanted to see Jesus. And so in chapter 19 of Luke, we see that he goes ahead and climbs up a tree. In verse 5, it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Can you imagine Zacchaeus' eyes, like they were looking at Jesus, and then Jesus stops and says, Hey, we little man, I see you up there. <laughs> can, can you imagine his eyes, how big they would have got? This, this guy is talking to me, and not only is he talking to me, he wants to come to my house today. Whoa. And look at Zacchaeus' response. And he says, um, so he hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. And when they, the tax or the uh, Pharisees and the religious leaders, when they saw it, they grumbled. He has gone, they, uh, and he has gone to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. Grumbling, man, Jesus, how dare him eat with such a man, a wealthy tax collector, chief tax collector. And he goes on and says, uh, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I have given to the poor, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Now, now this story is a story of reset, Right? Like Zacchaeus had a perspective, he had ambitions, he had a purpose for his wealth. But then he came into the presence of Jesus and everything was flipped upside down. He literally had this reset where his motivations, his use of his money, everything changed. Now just think about this, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He oppressed and abused people by taking their money and in this moment he interacts with Jesus. Now he is free to give away his money. Talk about a reset. All the people that he uh, had taken money from, he hoarded and hoarded and hoarded. And now he says, I want to give it away. Give it away, Jesus. This is the reset that we see in Zacchaeus' life. Now, now maybe you don't necessarily relate to Zacchaeus because he was a wealthy guy. And not all of us in this room would consider ourselves wealthy. But, but Zacchaeus underwent this transformation, this change. Not only how he viewed Jesus, but how he viewed his finances. And today, that's my prayer, that we would just take a step back and say, God, what do you want to say about my finances, my resources, my assets, and how do I use them? And I think the first thing that we all have to recognize is that you do not own anything. And I'm like, you're like, no, I got the deed, I got the car title, I own, and I'm telling you, you do not own. Our role is we are managers, right? Everything in the earth is God's. This is what we see in the Old and New Testament. We see this in Psalm 89, 11. It says, the heavens are yours, not yours, <laughs> God's. He's talking to God. The heavens are yours, God. The earth is also yours, God, the world and all it contains. You have founded them. So the Old Testament uh, psalmist writes, everything, God, is yours. Even though David had tons and tons of assets, tons of herds, tons of money, tons of women, unfortunately, tons of things. He says, listen, I've got all this, but guess what? I'm just a manager. It's all yours, God. 1 Corinthians, New Testament, chapter 10, verse 26 says, for the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. I think the place that we got to start today when we think about finances, how we view them, is they're not ours to begin with. In the church world, we talk about stewardship, right? We're stewards. That word steward really is a, a term that could be used for we're managers, right? Now, just think if you have a company and you come to me and say, hey, Derek, I want you to manage my company. So if I did that, for me to manage or steward that company well, what do I got to first recognize, right? I got to recognize that I've been given something. I've been given a company. I've been given a company that does not belong to me. That's the first step of stewardship. I've got something and it's not mine. The second role and step in stewardship is to recognize, I recognize, but now I've got to take responsibility. That I actually get to determine how this company grows, how we spend our money, what we do. And the purpose though, at the end of the day, if I'm gonna be a good steward, a good manager, is for me to work and do things in a way as I manage that will honor the person that owns it, right? That's your hope. If you're the owner, you want me to make some money for you. You want me to uh, uh, do what's right by you, to honor you, right? It's the same with our money. See, we're stewards. God has given us all that we have. It's all his. And he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to manage it. I want you to recognize you have it. Then I want you to take responsibility for the purpose of his glory. And we walk in honor to him. That's 
why we have what we have. That's why we're created. And our finances are an extension of that. So if we think about what God thinks about money, we should talk and take a pause. What's his perspective? If he's given me these assets to manage, what do I do with it? What would God want me to do with it? And I think the first thing we see is in 1 Timothy, uh, something that I think is taken out of context and has been abused on social media probably in some amazing ways. It's, it's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. He says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he gets to verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, now, many times we've taken this translation or, or this verse and we've used it and abused it. Now, I want you to know this. The first thing that we got to recognize is that money is not evil. Everybody say that. Money is not evil, right? It's not evil. Sometimes we believe that. God is not opposed and does not think everybody that has money is evil, right? Amen to that, right? So we got to recognize that. That when we talk about money, it's not like God is like, oh my goodness, I don't want them to have it. No, it's I want you to recognize what you've been given and I want you to honor me with it. That's what we're talking about today. The great reformer Martin Luther, he's got this great quote when it talks about finances and money. He says this, he says, if silver and gold are things evil in themselves, then those who keep away from them deserve to be praised. If money's evil, stay away and you'll be praised. But, it's a big but, but if they are good creatures of God, which we can use both for the needs of our neighbor and the glory of God, is not a person silly, yes, even unthankful to God, if he refrains from them as if they were evil. That's a good word right there. See, see, as followers of Jesus, we don't need to shy away from money. We don't need to be so scared of money that, man, I can't have money. No, we've got to first recognize it's not ours to begin with. It's ours to steward. And when we have it, it's not evil. We've got to see that. But what he says in this, what Paul says to this young man who's coming into ministry, he doesn't say money is evil. What he says is that the love of money leads to evil. That's a totally different thing. The love of money leads to all kinds of evil. Not money itself, but the love of money. And, and, And here's what he's getting at. The love of money. When we begin to love money, our hope is in money, what that becomes is an idol in our life, right? When it becomes all we think about, it becomes our pursuit, it becomes our passion, that, that, that money becomes an idol. And what an idol is, is anything that we have placed worth above God. Anything that we express our love to above God. Anything, listen to this, that we place our hope in that is above God. That is an idol. And God has some strong things to say about idols. Because he knows where it leads us. And what he says in the Ten Commandments to Moses, he gives us the two first commandments are attacking this. He says, first, don't have any other gods before me. Hey, guys, listen, I, I, know your, I know your flaws. I know your characteristics. I know your bents is to have other gods. But listen, don't, don't have another god before me, including money. Don't, don't do that. And the second thing he says is, is don't have any idols. Don't bow down to them. Don't submit to them. Don't place your hope in things that are not fulfilling, that will not be for eternity. This is what God says. And so he says, listen, money leads us to all types of, all kinds of evil. So we've got to be aware. Now, now, why is that? I think we should ask this question. And this is the quote that I think Francis Bacon hits on the head. He says this, money is a great servant, but a bad master. Have you ever heard of that before? Money is a great servant, but a bad master. When I have money, I can make it do many great things. But if my money, if my pursuit of money is what I'm after, it's going to lead me to destruction. Because the scriptures say time and time again, if your pursuit is riches, the riches aren't going to satisfy you. There's always going to be richer. I I love when I read books that talk about, you know, the millionaires in our society and they ask them, you know, what are you rich when you've got, you know, $4 million? And most of them say, no, actually, if I made $12 million, I'd be rich. And then you go survey the 12 to 20 millionaires and they say, are you rich? And they say, no, I I don't have 50 million. This is the case, right? When we get somewhere, we always want to go the next place, right? This is the reality of money. And the crazy thing about money, the challenge about money is it makes us do and think some crazy things. Somebody say amen to that, right? We do some wild things when we want to get some money, don't we? We do things we never thought we'd do because money has a strange way of making us feel in control. Money has a strange way of making us feel more powerful than we are. It it makes us feel invincible and it, it, it makes us feel like we are independent, that we can take care of ourselves. And Jesus speaks into this. 
in, in Matthew chapter 19, if you've got your Bible, flip open there. It's in the Gospels, and Jesus is, is doing his thing and walking around, and this young, rich man comes up to Jesus and asks him um, how to have entered into eternal life, how to step into the kingdom. And Jesus says, hey, do X, Y, and Z. And the young man says, yep, I've done that. I've, I've kept all those laws. And then Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Come and follow me. And it says the young man heard this and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. See, Jesus was not anti-possessions. He was anti-idolatry. Do you know that? In this moment, Jesus spoke right into the idol of this man's life. That's why he told him to give up everything, because he knew that would be the one thing that he would not get rid of. Because Jesus doesn't tell us all to give away everything, right? At some point, he says to give away half of your things. And some people, he doesn't ever say that to. But in this situation, he knew the idolatry in this man's life. And so he said, go and sell everything. And the man went away with his tail between his legs, sad, because he was not going to part from his possessions. And then Jesus is with the disciples, and, and they kind of have this sidebar conversation, and I love it. Chapter 19, verse 23 of Matthew. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Have you ever asked the question of why would Jesus say it's hard for a rich person to enter in the kingdom of God? Which, by the way, you're maybe sitting there and say, well, I'm not rich, Derek. I don't know if you've seen my paycheck. I'm not a rich person. I can check out. Well, here's the thing. Um, I read a statistic this week that said if you make $32,500 about that, uh, you would be considered one of the 1% richest people in the world. See, if we step back out of the American society and think about the big picture of wealth in the culture, in this day and age, like many of us would be considered very, very wealthy when we consider the whole world. Now, maybe not in America, but as we step out. But why did Jesus say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? I think it's, it's this thing. Money skews our perspective. Money skews our perspective when we have it. And, and how does it skew? I think there's two ways that money skews our, our, our perspective. Number one way is when we have money, adequate money, we begin to believe the lie that we have no need. We begin to believe that if I need it, I'm going to buy it. I feel secure when I've got money, right? I've got a savings account. I've got cash on hand. I feel secure. And when we get to that position, especially when we have extra money where I don't have to worry about things in the world, what happens is we begin to believe the lie that we don't have a need. And what Jesus would tell us that if somebody wants to receive this good news, this offering of grace, they have to first recognize their need in order to receive, right? And so he says, listen, guys, the rich guys around here, they don't recognize their need. And so it's going to be really hard for them to receive what I have for them to get into the kingdom of God. And so this, this money, this wealth, it has a strange way of skewing our perspective of our real need. And he says, it's going to be hard to get over that if you're rich. Now, it's not impossible, thankfully, right? With God, all things are possible, but it's challenging. And then the second thing I think uh, the way that excuse our perspective is it, it, money has this odd way of having us live in the moment, right? Like what can I get? What can I possess now? And, and when I have money, I'm like, what kind of assets can I accumulate? How can I set myself up? And we begin to think more and more of what I can get now. And we step farther and further away from this big picture of eternity. This is what money changes our perspective. We begin to lose sight of the big picture of what God is doing. And, and even with um, this week, uh, I think Thursday evening, a good friend of my wife and I, actually one of her best friends, passed away, 39 years old, from a second round of cancer. She was our worship leader in Ohio, and we were at church there. Phenomenal woman of faith, three young boys that, and an amazing husband that she's leaving. Our hearts been broken, just weeping and crying. But here's what these kind of moments do in life. And she would tell you the same thing while she was alive. She did. She would say, listen, take a step back. Like her, her, her 39 years on life, even if she lived another 40 years to be 79, pale in comparison to the eternity that she's into right now. Tens of thousands of years in the presence of God make any span of life, even if you're lucky or unlucky and you live to be 110 
That's a snap in time. That's a blink of an eye. That's a vapor that's vanishing. And so when we think about money, it makes us think about the now. How can I get now? How can I get as many assets as I can now? And it keeps us from thinking about the big picture of eternity. And so he says, be careful because it's challenging to walk into the kingdom if you've got a lot of resources because you're not going to recognize your need. And you're going to be living so much for today that you're not going to think about tomorrow or eternity. Now, when we think about money in those sense, we've got to recognize first that money is not eternal. I don't know but you know this, but there's no Benjamins or um, Washingtons on paper in heaven. Anybody know that? There's not even Bitcoins. I don't know if you guys heard about Bitcoins. A little volatile right now, so I don't know if you want to invest right now. But Bitcoins will at some point be outdated. Our current currency will not be in heaven. Why is that? Because money is not eternal. We come into this world naked, and what the writer of Ecclesiastes would say, we're going to leave the world naked. The money that we have, the finances that we have, the stock markets, the property, all the things that we long for, which are not all bad once again, they're not going to be eternal because, once again, right, you don't own them. You're stewarding them. You're managing them. Somebody else is going to have them, and eventually they're not going to be part of eternity, right? And so we got to remember this, and and, and I've heard somebody say time and again, again, this isn't new, but but I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. That's a simple truth, right? It's, it's true. Like, we don't take what we have because money is not eternal. But as we say that, does that mean that we shouldn't care about money? No. Because here's the truth that I think I really want all of us to get today. This this truth. Money is not eternal, but its impact can be. Money is not eternal. We all know that. But the impact of money can be Eternal. We can actually sow into things. We can give money to things. We can set up things that will have eternal value. Somebody's salvation could come because you funded a missionary overseas or even in this city. Our money has the potential to impact eternity. This is what we need to recognize. It is a gift. How are you stewarding? How are we using it for the kingdom of God? Because how we invest, how we leverage, how we allocate our finances, it matters to God because there's much bigger things at play than things. Eternity could be changed by the way we spend our money. I was in Houston before I was ever a pastor and there was a gathering of some business leaders in the church and they got us around and they were talking about missions and this mission strategy was called BAM, B-A-M, Business as Missions. And they had all these business guys around and we were talking about you know, how do we leverage our networks? How do we leverage our resources? How do we leverage our, our giftedness and our talents? How do we do this uh, on another place in the world for the kingdom of God, for the good news of Jesus to come through? And so we were asking these questions and we were talking about the potential ways that our businesses and our backgrounds could be leveraged in a way that God could be known in a place where he's not currently known. And then at some point during the meeting, they said, hey, um, how many of you know what ROI is? Now, remember, this is a group of business guys, and so everyone's like, yeah, I know what ROI is, right? Return on investment, right? That, that, that term means, like, if, I, if I've got an investment opportunity and I put $10,000 into it, my hope is when that, return, that, that investment comes to its life cycle or when there's a, a change or, or when there's a cash out, that that return of $10,000 will yield me $10,000 plus and additional money, a thousand, ten thousand, whatever that is, that's the return on investment that we all hope for. So when we invest in stocks, we hope for a return that's more than what we put in it. When we invest in real estate, our hope is that it yields not only what we paid for it, but an additional amount of money, right? That's ROI. And he said, but, but how many of you guys, and he's talking to a room full of women, men and women of business background, he said, how many of your portfolios, which he said are, I'm sure are very diversified, how many of your portfolios include KROI? And you can see the guys, they're kind of looking around. What in the world is that? He said, how many of you consider when you're looking at your portfolio, the kingdom return on investment? Hmm, that's interesting. Never thought of that before. Never heard that term before. Kingdom return on investment. And it made me start thinking. You know, I've got my 401k, my 403b, I've got my IRA, I've got my savings, I've got my check. we got all of those things, maybe a few, maybe all of them, maybe a lot more. But, but how many of us take a pause and say, How many of my investments are going to yield eternal dividends? 
are actually going to make a difference in eternity, but also for the kingdom to come today, this KROI. And as I was thinking about kingdom return on investment, uh, this reality that, that came to me was that money is an opportunity, not a destination. Money is an opportunity, not a destination. We've been given money for a season with an opportunity. It's not meant to just stay here in our hands for us to hoard, right? Money is an opportunity to give glory to God, not a destination for you to hold on to and place your hope and trust in. This is what finances are to God. It's an opportunity. And as we start thinking about that, it begins to make us question, how, how am I viewing money and how am I spending my money? And am I sowing any of my money, any of my, my finances into things that are going to last for more than just my life cycle on this earth? Is there anything that I'm spending and investing in that's eternal? And this is what Jesus talks about. The last thing I want to look at is Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is talking about treasure. In verse 19, he begins to talk about money. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in to steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and their thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I just want to just to make sure we know this. Jesus did not say that possessions are wrong. Like, I don't want you guys to come in here with no clothes on. Like, you'll easily get an exit out of here very quickly with a row, a towel or something around you. We'll get you out of here. So clothes are not bad. Transportation is not bad. You know, we're not in a city. We don't have a bunch of houses around us. You got to have a way, whether it's a bike or uh, a car or something to, to get here. What Jesus is not saying is that possessions are bad. He knows that we got to have them. He even said, hey, I'm going to give you clothes. I'm going to provide for you. He says that earlier. So he doesn't say possessions are bad. But what he's saying is be careful that your priority is not on things that are temporary. Be careful that the things that you're investing in, the direction you're allocating your money, that they're not all being sown into things that have a shelf life, that, that there is something bigger, something longer lasting. And what he says here, he said, instead of wasting all your money, putting all your money into things that are going to rust away in the mosque, he said, instead, why don't you sow them in things that are going to last for eternity, things that are going to yield heavenly rewards. This is what Jesus says. And then he says this last line. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I talked about this a few months ago, but, but this, this truth is something that we all know, right? When we make an investment, and specifically if we make a substantial investment, how many of you know we begin to care more and more about that investment? Like if I put $10,000 in Apple like 30 years ago, I would have been a genius, right? And I would have watched that thing grow and grow and grow, and now I would have a lot of money. And my attention would be put on that. Why? Because my treasure, my money has been placed in that. Or when we send the kids to college, guess what? Your money goes with them. Guess where your heart is? Not just because your kid's there, but why else? Because your money's there, right? We know this is true. Where our money is, our heart is going to be. And that's what Jesus tells us. He said, this is true today. If, if you want to know where your, where your heart is, where is your money going? Like, look at where you're spending your money. And, and I'm telling you, you'll find out those areas where you're spending the majority of your money is where your heart is. But the promise in this passage as well is that where your treasure goes, your heart will go also. And so this morning, we can even have a reset to say, man, where am I sending my heart? How am I allocating my money? Because my, my allocation of my money, where I send it, it's going to influence my heart. And so even this morning or this week, um, ask that question, where am I sending my heart? And where are you sending your finance? Because that's where your heart's going to be. And this week, my challenge for you w would be to take a, a look at your finances. And maybe you do that all the time. Maybe you use a, an awesome program or maybe you just old school checkbooks or whatever. Uh, but take some time and look at how much are you making, bringing in, and how much are you spending? Now, the first thing we should do is, this is rocket science here, we want to spend less than we make. We all good with that? That's the hope. Now, I know I'm not laughing at some people. A lot of us are upside down on that, and I, I get that. And that's why I love this financial peace thing that we're getting ready to do, because it's going to help us balance out. Because how many of you know if you're in the hole and you're losing money every week, you can't bless other people. And that's not how any of us want to live. So we want to first balance that out and say we want to make more than we spend, right? That's the first. But then we should ask the question, where, where are we spending our money? And just look at it. And don't, don't make it more than it is. Just look at it. where are you spending your money? And then I would have you ask the question, is where you're spending your money where you want your heart? 
is, is that what you want? Because I'm telling you, if you want your heart to be somewhere else, maybe you don't have a heart for missions, but you want a heart for missions, guess what I would tell you to do? You start investing some money for the next couple months in missions. And what I'm telling you is that your heart will follow. You're struggling to, to find a, a, some, a heart for the local community. I'm telling you, if you begin to pour some money into the local community and the ministries that are happening all over the city, what's going to happen is your heart will follow because this is what Jesus promised. Your treasure will lead your heart and your heart will be where your treasure is. So where is it going? Where are you spending your money? And do you carry the perspective that God has for your finances? That's the question we have today. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that, um, man, you didn't shy away from talking about something that so easily grasps our heart, our money. And uh, I thank you for that. I thank you that you make it clear that money is not evil, but it, it can lead to evil. And so, Lord, we want to be a church that stewards our money well. We want to be individuals that steward our money well to recognize the purpose of it is to glorify you. And so, Lord, would you bring increase to our fields? Would you increase um, how much we bring in so that we could bless your name and we can glorify you in the process? We praise you, Jesus.